dedication by going through the level or the layer or the stage of regulated service. When they get to Raganuga Bhakti, then they should not be considered fallen, they should be considered more advanced. And similarly, those who reach the stage of bhava and prema, they should be considered most advanced, even though they don't follow any of the regulative principles externally. Right? They have completely internalized them. So try to understand what we're shooting for. The aim here is prema bhakti. Prema bhakti means intense, spontaneous love of Krishna. And if somebody has that love, then we can't complain or criticize them if they don't externally follow all the rules and regulations. But if someone doesn't have that love, they better follow those rules and regulations because how else are they going to attain it? See? That's the criteria. So these bhavas that we're talking about, these aren't ordinary emotions because they're emotions in relation to Krishna. When someone is feeling those emotions, when they're in bhava, then they manifest all kinds of different symptoms. Huh? Not out of a physical cause, but out of a spiritual cause, which is their relationship with Krishna. We want to make this very clear. Huh? These aren't ordinary emotions. They're spiritual emotions. And the symptoms that these emotions give rise to are also spiritual. And they're due to the devotee's intense emotional relationship with Krishna. And when that relationship is disturbed for any reason, then they go through these different symptoms. Like I remember when I was in ISKCON, for example, I used to get sick. Actually, now I never get sick. Or if I have my body has a little imbalance or something, I can easily correct it. Huh? Then I was getting seriously ill. Why? Because my god brothers kept interfering with my relationship with Krishna, with my relationship with Srila Prabhupada. Uh, they wouldn't let me be on the spontaneous platform. They insisted that I come to the reg platform of regulative principles. They did not understand, for example, that verse that I just quoted by Rishabdev, that when one attains the result of a particular spiritual activity, he should give up the process that he used to attain it. You see? When one attains the platform of spontaneous love and devotion for Krishna, then he can give up the process of regulated devotional service. Actually, most people, or most devotees, never even follow that, that process very accurately. So they can't claim to have attained the result of it. See? But for those of us who did follow it for many years, then we can say, okay, I followed that and I got the result. And now I don't have to practice these regulative principles so strictly because I'm on the platform of spontaneous devotional service, Raga Nuga Bhakti. And I'm following the example of such and such devotee. You see? Like that. So this is all very subtle and it's all dependent on the devotee's integrity and honesty. Uh, if someone is saying, well, I'm on the platform of Raganuga Bhakti, and they're not, then this is a great offense, and they are fallen. But if someone really is on that platform, they should get the, the benefit of that. They should be recognized for that. That's our whole uh, contention with our God brothers. Our God brothers do not want to recognize us because we follow the path of spontaneous devotional service. They're saying, no, you can't do that. <laughs> did, I, did I ever tell that story? One time I was talking to a Scientologist. And I said to him, well, it's very nice what Ron Hubbard has done uh, because if he didn't do that, I would have had to do it in order to figure out the, the nature of the human mind and how it functions and all of that. This guy didn't know it, but I had gone back to Hubbard's source materials, huh? which was Korzybski and uh, other researchers back in those days. And you know, if, if Hubbard hadn't figured out some way of actually accessing 
in treating the different uh, aspects of the mind and resolving the different um, you know, wrong computations in the mind, I would have had to figure it out all by myself because part of my purpose was to do that. So this guy looked at me and he said with complete sincerity, you can't think that. <laughs> you can't think that. <laughs> I mean, really, it took all my self-control not to just crack up completely. Because <laughs> this guy is such a nonsense. You can't think that. Well, guess what? I just did. <laughs> so, this is, also there's a, a nice essay by Paul Graham called What You Can't Say. And, and his point is that the things that we can't talk about reveal gaps in our cultural knowledge. Uh, they, they reveal aberrations in our, in our cultural mindset. Uh, the, the things that people consider shocking in this culture and in this time are often just completely normal in another culture or another time. See. And uh, the best way that we can see these things is by looking in history or looking at anthropology and seeing what different cultures consider normal and abnormal or, on the other hand, consider shocking and taboo. Uh, the things that Triobrand Islanders uh, 300 years ago considered shocking and taboo are very different from the things that we consider shocking and taboo. And the things that were normal for those islanders, you know, like walking around naked in public, uh, would be considered shocking and taboo for us today. You see? So the, these different cultural relativities usually indicate that those taboos, and those things that are considered shocking, aren't really so shocking. They're just cultural norms, cultural fashions. And like hemlines go up and down with the, the fashions of the day, the sim similar the uh, moral fashions or the taboos, the things that you can't talk about, the things you can't say, the things you can't discuss, uh, they also are subject to fashions. Uh, so in ISKCON today we have this fashion that you can't talk about Raganuga Bhakti, you can't talk about Bhava Bhakti, you can't talk about self-realization and especially you can't say I'm self-realized, you can't say I'm on the platform of Raganuga Bhakti. You can't say, I'm an advanced devotee, I'm an Uttam Adhikari, or even a Madhyam Adhikari. Everybody has to say, oh no, I'm just a neophyte, I'm lower than the straw in the street, I don't know anything, I haven't realized anything, and I have to just be at the lowest level of devotional service forever. Oh, I don't buy that. I don't accept that. See? So there are two ways with dealing with cultural... Uh, taboos and relativities. One way is through diplomacy. Uh, you yourself think whatever you like. You just don't say anything about it. And then there's the other thing we can do which is just take yourself out of that culture and put yourself in a culture that uh, isn't so aberrated. Well I tried the first method for many years. I didn't talk about or I tried to limit talking about the things that I thought that were part of this con's cultural blind spots. But that didn't work out very well because I couldn't express my feelings. I couldn't express my normal feelings of love for Krishna. I was inhibited. I was, I was um, actually prohibited from speaking these things. And when I did speak them, I got in huge trouble. So uh, that was so painful. I had to take myself out of this kind. It was actually less painful to be in a society of ordinary materialistic people because they just didn't care what I, what I said. But gradually, somehow or other, we have put together a small group of people who understand these issues. And it's okay with them if I'm self-realized. Because guess what? That means they can become self-realized too. Uh, Anybody can become self-realized. Everybody should become self-realized. We're not a religion. 
We're not trying to stop people from becoming self-realized by creating an artificial intermediary between them and God. We're saying everyone should become self-realized by having a direct personal relationship with God. That way, I get to have my personal relationship with God too. <laughs> That's normal. See, that is the normal spiritual condition. That's healthy. That's where everybody should be and actually is if they would only remember it. So everybody can attain self-realization. Everybody can become advanced. But very few people will become advanced. Huh? Why? Because they choose not to. They, they choose to remain attached to the material illusion based on the bodily conception of life. And that's their choice. We can't do anything to force them. Huh? But we say, if 